something a little bit about where you're from and, and the kind of work you do. We'll, get, we'll dig into it more so you don't have to go too far into your work, but just give them an idea of who you are and what you do. Sure. My name is Kaden Phoenix. Hi everyone, I'm a third generation Chicano from East LA. I have a universe of Latino superhero graphic novel. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Pablo. I'm from Guatemala. Um, uh, this is like the, the 
intro for it, but it's free online. Um, if you go to Takahogato Comics, you can find the links to get to it. But um, so it's basically, um, it's like a cute little fairy tale fantasy, but I guess underneath it all, it's more like about leadership and how leaders and their traumas and their um, their their pride and things like that can really change the way they leave a country or a land or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's, there's more to it, but that's kind of like the overall thing. And then I have these other two that I work in between. I have Sugar Mommy. <laughs> that one's like a little bio of me growing up in South Central LA. And then I have Taco Vata, which is like the main one. I started back in like 2013. And it's about the superhero cat that makes tacos out of thin air, and he's really embarrassed about it. <laughs> <laughs> other, people, other people are not so disappointed. They're like, yes, great. You will note that it's taco and gato, and not tacos de, de gato, but it's oh, like yeah, totally yeah. different. Yeah. So it's kind of a very darker, a much darker. <laughs> um, th my series, uh, Paco Comandera, is kind of like inspired by the fact that when I was growing up um, in Reno San Macalan, um, like curanderas were like a central part of, of my life, right? And then the life of my father and of my grandma and my grandma and so forth. You know, just whenever you, there's some kind of ailment or some like stranger has been staring at you too long as a, as a baby and like now you've got an awful and you're going to go to the, you know, but I'm going to, there were always the, almost like superhuman people in the community that could fix your ailments, that could heal you physically, spiritually, like sometimes you can even come to them with your romantic problems and they would help you out, I mean, they were you know, therapists and all kinds of stuff, and just as a kid, it's always struck me as, you know, something special, um, and I didn't realize maybe just how special until I you know, left the, the borderlands and went to other places and realized that they weren't like a common facet of American life or anything. Um, and so when I began thinking about different Things to do with the comics, and my love of like steampunk and like the like darker comics of the 70s and 80s and historietas that I used to read when I was a kid made me realize yeah, it would be really really awesome to have a, a, a young like apprentice curandera be the the, the heroine of a, of a book and so um, I kind of came up with this idea of a, a Frankenstein retelling or remix that would have this um, apprentice uh, curandera Cristina Franco. Um, in an alternate universe in 1865 where northern Mexico and, and south Texas are their own republic called the Republic of Santander where steampunk magic and, and I mean, steampunk technology and indigenous magic coexist. She gets attacked by lechuzas, by witch owls, while waiting for her brother um, at the train station and she's left for dead and her brother who's an alchemist brings her back to life but now she's got like robotic uh, legs and one robotic arm. You think about it, curandera is about the natural world, about plants, hierbas, and like that. Like, what does it do to you when you're no longer able to connect with your purpose in life, to be a healer for people, when you're going to be rejected by people because you're a cyborg now, or whatever? And then, you know, the mystery of why these creatures attack her and so forth. So, you know, it's just me taking things from my childhood and, like, turning them into, like, badass, like, comic book stuff. And, um, it came out in English and in Spanish, and then there'll be three books in the series. So it was, a, it was a super pleasure to create. Talk to us about it. Uh, yeah, so my current book, uh, Zero Garden on 81st Street, is a graphic retelling of uh, the classic Secret Garden. And um, all of the characters are, um, well, most of them are, um, uh, uh, are people of color. And it's just a really beautiful story about um,
white and rich area. And so I wanted to create a slice of white comic that represented the community that it came from. So um, all the characters are brown, and they're just living their lives and being teenagers, which I think is really accessible to anybody and an opportunity to tell a story about brown people that's not coming from a and stereotypical perspective. So, um, so we'll just stick around to 2024 to, to get that book because I, it's, I'm really hoping that people will like it. So let's talk about inspirations. What what inspired us to to work in this space, to do the particular kind of work we're doing, to either illustrate or write comics, whatever it happens to be. So like, what would you kind of point to as your inspirations? Okay. I'm a writer and director in the film industry, independent, and so I wrote out a feature length screenplay first of the Latino Superior Fortalesco, and I shot a short film, so a sizzle, so I can use it, so I can pitch it, and everyone I showed it to asked me where's the comic. And every single time I said no, or there's no comic, or there's no graphic novel. Um, and so I showed it to X amount of people, and that was literally the response every single time. And so by truth, by consensus, I was like, okay, I might as well do a comic. Um, just so, because it, there should be a comic, uh, according to everyone. And so I pivoted, and I went this way, and I started doing comics. Uh, I researched it, comics versus graphic novels, which made the most sense for me financially. And so I chose graphic novels, and I adapted my screenplay to a comic story, per se. And I did the rough storyboards, you know, I taught myself the whole world of, like, you know, pencil, ink, color, letters, all the stuff you have to do, but I had no idea. But either way, it's still a collaboration, it's still storytelling, right? Just one's moving pictures, one's stills. And that's the difference between the two, the way I break it down. And so I found everybody, like, on Instagram, and then inspiration is because I want Latina representation. I want a Latina superhero on the big screen because we still don't have one, right? We have America Chavez coming up in Disney Plus um, and Doctor Strange, uh, but it's a TV series and she's a side character. Eventually she will get one, which is great. But, you know, why can't we do it ourselves? Because no one else is obviously doing it for us. And so, it's my inspiration. Yeah. Well said, I mean, and, and the, I always think about this with like Marvel and DC and others is, you know, it's, it's fantastic that they have more representation. We want them, we need to push them, but at the same time, there's still two monolithic, you know, things, and, and we need to be getting our own stories out there as much as possible as well. So that's, okay. I, I, I love the fact that you that you've moved in that direction. So, cool. Pablo, what about you? Yeah. Um, yeah, how do I follow that up? <laughs> uh, so I um, actually my, my day job is at, um, I'm an assistant art director at uh, Disney. So I my first love is animation. Um, and I mean, they're all interconnected. Uh, how I got there was I was going to school and um, I went to a, a screening of, uh, you guys have probably seen this movie, uh, Book of Life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love a little indie movie. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I was watching, and I, you know, around that time, um, I think. You know, of course, the Tigre had come out, but other other than that, it was um, Dora, this tour. <laughs> That's the only other uh, big thing, which, you know, I, after working in the industry and finding out all the story about that, I uh, had a heart attack. Um, so I came out of the movie and I was like, you know, like, he's he made this, uh, the director's made this so. You know, he's so unapologetically Mexican about it. And I was like, yeah, you know, I want to do that. Yeah. So that's how I got into the animation industry. Um, and for comics, though, it was because, unfortunately, I did lose my faith in the animation industry. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of things happening at the time. Um, you know, we have, we cycled through crisis after crisis at the border. And around that time, there was a one time when, um, a lot of like unaccompanied children were coming in, and this is like years, years ago, although we keep going through it. Um, and I started making like com just web, little web comments about that stuff because I was like, you know, I care about this. You know, somebody out there should probably care about this. So, um, so yeah, that's pretty much been my, my driving inspiration of things. Just me trying to care about something <laughs> and trying to be like, oh, maybe somebody else does. Uh, I mean, 
and over the years, like it's been, it's wavered a little bit, you know, for a lot of things. But um, uh, yeah, not to be a bummer about it, not to be a bummer about it, but you know. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, you're working in, in an industry that where it's really, really tough to to get representation of, of people from communities of color or queer representation, or whatever. So of course, and you, like you said, you know, you're hearing the inside stories about all kinds of stuff that if people knew, they would like. Yeah. 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 What about you, Candy? What are your inspirations? Um, oh, I I guess as a little girl, um, I also got into cartoons and animation, like monkeys. Like um, uh, you know, growing up in the 90s, there was like awesome animation cartoons, and I was like really into it. Um, as I got older, I started getting more inspired by other work, like Jim Henson stuff, like the Storyteller, and um, some of the movies, also like anime, uh, uh, some of the Tsuka stuff, and um, I guess I started getting more inspired by stories, and, and then um, now at, at this age, I, I guess I just find inspiration in everything, um, like, in, I don't know, just being in nature or um, uh, getting into history and, and just reflecting on life, I guess, and just like the whole world as a, a whole. And you can just write stories about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. I mean, I that, that kind of like just, like, I need to do it just, just something that's uh, yeah. really important. Um, for me, with in, the inspiration um, for for writing in general and for this specific comic is you know all tied up with with my family who's full of storytellers and, and growing up you know, the stories of like my grandmother, grandson, my tia and this, but the kinds of scary, horrible things and like you know, the, the truth of la mano pacho and crazy stuff like that that kind of like got me interested in in storytelling, dark storytelling, and like pushed me into reading comics. Now, I'm 51, so like, you know, tiger. House of Secrets from DC in like the 70s and Swamp Thing. And, and I was also reading, you know, historietas like Kaliman, all the real pulpy kind of stuff. Um, and, and it kind of informed my interest as I got older. Um, I was an early adopter of like manga and um, you know, Ghost in the Shell and uh, Battle Angel Alida, things like that were um, like just like left a desire in me to do something in that space. And, you know, I eventually went on and became a novelist, and, and uh, when I was, uh, I got an award in 2016 from the American Library Association, you know, the Puro Pre, uh, one, one of my books, one of the three picked that year, was best of Latino writing for kids. Um, and I was asked by a publisher um, that, who invited me to dinner if, if I had an idea for a graphic novel that I wanted to pitch them, and that's when it was like kind of it gelled in my mind, um, this idea of, taking a 17-year-old apprentice curandera and turning her into a cyborg. Um, you know, it, when you do something like that, like, you, you want to take the aesthetic of comics that exist already, but infuse them with the sensibilities of like your own culture, heritage, background, the people that are around you in your community and so forth. Um, it's a, it can be a transformative thing, right? You can do it in a way that is merely like, brown-facing, what already exists, or you can do it in a really transformative way that, that takes the medium and flips it on its on its head. Um, and I mean, I, I think that's something that, that all of us here have in common is that we're that we're doing work that is that, that has its own unique voice. It comes from like a very personal place of of creative uh, sensibility and identity. So what about you? What about your inspiration? Yeah. So um, I grew up similar to most people here. Um, animation. When I was younger, I was, when I saw The Lion King, I was like, oh my god, I have to be in this industry. And um, when I went to art school, I sort of had this revelation that like, oh man, I need to make money. 
and the stuff I was interested in. And um, as much as I like things like Robotech and um, all the other anime and uh, types of story telling out there, it was what I loved the most. And um, so at the end of the credits of Taylor Moon, yeah. it says based off the comic by Naomi Takuichi. And I was like, holy shit, this was written by one person. And she illustrated it, she wrote it, I was like, you can do that? And um, I really wanted to do that, but again, it was back to the, oh, I even need money. <laughs> and so I had that whole career in UX design. And, um, but I like to think that that sort of influences the way that I draw and make my pages. I'm really interested in making sure that it's easy to navigate a page and easy to read. Um, but, so, the internet and um, how it affects people is also sort of an inspiration. So, Sugar Coated is actually about a, a catfish, and uh, so the main character is a catfish. And um, so I'm just really interested in how people interact online and how they form relationships and connect with each other. Cool. Um, let's talk about barriers. I mean, we've hinted at some of the barriers. Um, um, and you know, some of us work in the indie space, some of us work in industry, some of us work, you know, like traditional publishing, whatever it happens to be. Um, uh, but all of us have undoubtedly had to, like, <laughs> you know, move, move through some barriers, move past some barriers to get where we are. So, Kaden, um, I, I don't know if you want to talk about any of those in particular that you've had to grapple with. I mean, you've hinted at some. But I mean, just <laughs> when, when, you, when you were talking about the stereotypes people have of chicanas uh -huh. as being like chola stuff like that, and like having to, uh -huh. to grapple with that, to me that seems like like the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like, oh, that's so the stereotype. Um, in yeah. regards to barriers and regards to the comic book industry, I had none. I self-publish, so I have all the control. Mm -hmm. So if I say I want Latina penciler, ink or graphic, you know, everything I have to design my letters, etc., and I want 74 pages this time instead of 96. I can do it um, because I am the producer and editor of my own project. So I, I don't, thus far I've had barriers in that sense. Um, I'm at Comic Con because they found me on Instagram. Like it was really that easy. They asked me to pitch and they like pitched two panels. And of course I got one and then I got invited. Uh, and so if there's little things, it's just something that's just it, in regards to, okay, do we get stereotyped? Yes, of course. Are we stuck in a certain rut of how we're seen? Yes, but that is why people like us exist up here. Right, like none of us are our stereotype, because why would we be? We're not, you know, we're not, we don't have that white prerogative. We have that Phoenix prerogative, so we see ourselves as humans, as people, because why wouldn't we? And so I, I myself have not had money barriers, honestly, in regards to the comic book industry. Uh, people are aware of it. I don't need to say why I have a Latina superhero. That's a given as to why. People understand it very, very easily. So I'm very fortunate in that sense. Cool. What about you, Pablo? Hmm. Any barriers? Yeah, um, the, so the my upcoming book, um, I, th I feel like I brushed through it pretty fast. It's, it's called Silence Voices, and it's about, again, set in the Guatemalan Civil War during the 80s. And um, I've been pitching that for like 10 years, and it never really, it was always like, you know, we're not really interested in this. This is not a country who gives a shit. And the other one was, um, that I read like a like a like a history book, which is fair. You know my my abilities. I think we all have gotten better to, to do this. Um, so I did take a little bit of time, and that's that's one where I'm like, uh, a part of me is glad that it finally happened when my skills are, uh, you know, comfortable level. On the other hand, I'm like, well, it took took ten years, so. Um, the uh, in my in my main job, my industry, my animation industry job. I mean, I think things are moving a little bit forward, a little better. But um, right now, the the wall is okay. So we finally have um, stories about you know Latinos, Latin families. Um, unfortunately, we're still like they're still being written by other people. Um, so, you know, not to get too personal about this, but, you know, even in my own, uh, my own show, like, it's, you know, the main, the bosses are not 
Latinos. I was more or less, I, I look at it and I, I see like a lot of my designers, a lot of other people that are under me and, um, and me, and I'm like, oh, I, I see why you brought us here. Uh, but, you know, uh, it would be nice to have somebody else closer to that ethnicity, maybe have a say here or there. So, so we're still there. We're, we're, there is, it's moving. Um, so, you know, I, did, I do have like a, another side project, kind of like what you said, where, you know, I'm writing it, I'm designing it, um, I'm, I'm, you know, going around begging people to fund me for it. Because, uh, you know, I'm, I, I kind of, you know, especially after 2020 and like how, you know, we're, we're very much mortals right now. And it's like, no, I, I don't want to sit here and just wait, just wait until it happens. So, you know, I don't know. So those are the barriers right now.
indigenous Mexican traditions from schools that are majority Mexican American is one of the reasons that we're in the situation we're in. Um, and so I, I, I want our voices to be part of that conversation, and it means fighting hard fights and, and, and like prejudices about like writing style and voice, and, like why you have a particular. You, you, everybody who's read YA knows I'm talking about this, this kind of smarmy, smart alecky, rebellious teen kind of voice, very, you know, very internal, very emotional, stuff like that. And that's what they want all the shit to sound like. And if you, you know, if you're a Chicana author and you're doing something that is markedly different from that, you get pushback. And when that's what needs to be reformed, there needs to be space for the kinds of voices that exist in our community, which are not the same as the voices that exist in middle, upper middle class. Um, Anglo-Saxon communities on the East Coast, right? So, um, yeah, that's the fight. And those are the barriers that I've come up against. But um, there, things have begun to change. The tide has begun to turn. Um, but still, exacts like you know, like Pablo was saying, like I do story consulting for Victor and Valentino, which is you know, Cartoon mm -hmm. Network show that I really recommend. But it's so really a lot of fun. And um, when <laughs> when Warner Brothers, you know, acquired Cartoon Network, like uh, suddenly you had this <laughs> new set of yes, yeah, so, oh, yeah, this whole new set of like execs who are like, like looking at Victor Valentino, like, what the fuck? They like they don't get it, you know? They're like, what is what's going on here? We get doing, um, we we'll slash this budget, you know, already like super minimal budget where you, you you can't even I mean like writers for animated series for Cartoon Network are not even. They're not allowed to write scripts. They have to do storyboards. Because they write scripts, they have to be WGA. Um, uh, yeah. Oh my God. They have to be in there. Yeah, they have to be mm -hmm. in the, the writer's guild. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it's just some wild and all stuff. And those are the kinds of barriers that people are constantly pushing back against. And, um, so, I mean, I don't want to, those of you who are, you know, who are aspiring creatives in this room, illustrators, writers, animators, and so forth, I, I don't, I'm not trying to discourage you. A lot of work has been done to, to hold the door open and push it open wider and to make sure that the gates are, are available for people to access. But it, uh, just understand that the thought is still ongoing. It probably will be for many, many decades to come. I'm sorry, I just took a little bit too long. What, what about you, Amber? Any, any uh, barriers that you want to chat with? Yeah, I think um, when I graduated from art school, I was really interested in the idea of And so, again, that sort of what drove me into the 
another box being checked, but at the same time, taking that opportunity and being uh, with these publishers who have the capacity to publish in such a huge way. Scholastic has such a huge reach. They um, have the book fairs and um, the book clubs, and having that opportunity is hard to pack up. And, um, but you know, before that, I was big on the on self publishing, and I still am. I still think it's the <coughs> most important way to get the stories you want out. And um, huge like Zine Stir, I love Zine Fest. Um, it's the most accessible way to table. If you're uh, you know short on cash, it's a lot of the times Zine Fest will uh, they will cover the cost of your table. And, um, so. Yeah, it's, I, I think there are a lot of barriers, but I feel like those barriers are being broken at the moment, but you never know, because it might just be mine. And to add to that, so Raina, she has a book called Smile. It's backed by Scholastic. It's one of the best-selling ones. It's about a little girl that gets braces, and everything that goes wrong getting braces. So like her tooth goes through the gum, and like everything just really gross and creepy. And so like she did break her, so I'm glad you brought her up. It's a really fun story as well. Definitely. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about process. I mean, anything that you want to discuss about your process as a creator, um, I think there are probably people in the audience that are, are interested in, in that sort of thing, the, 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 the title of the panel of storytelling art. So what's your process of uh, storytelling? Anything at all that you want to share? Okay. I'm more on the business side, so I'll just break it down for you really easily. <laughs> so uh, for Jalisco, which is the person I was talking, talking about, I had to learn everything online of like obviously what you need as in regards to the artist, I do not draw, I'm just the writer creator myself. And so I learned that and then I, I went through them and I was like, okay, we're all gonna, because there's there was like six of us, there's three colorists, one inker, one penciler, the third restriction. And so my inker is just like, why don't you work on a Google Drive? Because then we can all see each other's work and everybody has their own folder. And I was like, okay. And so like if it's four penciler, like so I do my storyboard, my roughs, right? And so that's pretty much like my four penciler. When penciler's done, she puts it in the PSD file, the Photoshop file, and for inker. So now the inker knows it's her job. Then she's done, she puts it in for colors, et cetera. And you keep going to like four letters and then finish, right? There's an old folder finish and a to-do a to-do list. Right? Because that's the business. Like it's very easy for everyone to keep track of each other's work if they wanted to, but to be like, oh, it's my turn to do page five, et cetera. So that is my process in regards to the workflow. Uh, for thinking of the stuff, I just think, um, I thought of my five superheroes at all at the same time. It was really easy for me. Uh, I just think of, and the, it was their superheroes and their, um, their superpowers and their name. It wasn't really their location or what the story arc or anything of that. So when I focused on it, then I was like, okay, what, what social justice issue gets me back? Then I was like, okay, good, I can write about it. Right, and I continued down the line. And I just, that's how I start my story is when I'm gonna write it out. What, well, gets me mad. It's like violence. Great, that's fun, Pizza. Right, and so same thing. And then you research it, and I continue writing in regards to my my story writing process, and I, I outline everything. <laughs> All right. I'm just seems exhausted at that. <laughs> um, so I'm fairly new with writing, so I don't I don't know if I should even comment on that. Other than um, you know, one time uh, one of my some mentors, I guess. Uh, he just phrased it as uh, write as if you're drawing, because my simple brain, that's what it knows. I just know how to draw, and that's it. Um, uh, as far as like the process is for me for drawing, for art, um, I, don't, I don't have a, normally I don't have a colorist, I do everything, because um, uh, I have an ego like that. <laughs> I just prefer, it, it, the way I do things, I do have a, a thumbnail phase, and then I do a, a, a loose layout, and then I go straight to color. Because I'm, I'm more of a painter, um, and, and, and then I add like a few clean lines here and there. Uh, com completely messed up process. I have to always like convince the editors to like to let me do this, and I have to always have a call and be like, this is how I do it, this, this, and I, I have to like, pull out the, the graphs and <laughs> it's really, really an annoying process, but uh, annoying for both of us, me and the editor. Um, so that's the way I, I do it. Um, how I'm going to make 250 pages of a book like that in, in less than a year, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out together. Um, you will be doing very little else. Yeah. I have another book on oh, top of that no. and I have my day job. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a mess, uh, you know. It's one, 
I think this is I think this qualifies as a barrier because uh, <laughs> I um, I don't know about you guys, but like for for me, once I I gained like a little bit of, of rep where I wasn't looking for the jobs, the jobs were coming to me. I was like, yes, give me that shit. I'll take it. I'll say I said yes to everything. I ended up with like four or five projects on top of me, and and I just burned out. Just burned out so bad. So I think that's it, it's one thing that I I am still learning how to say no to things because um, you know we're, um, as far as the, the art side goes. We're kind of like athletes, you know. Like drawing is so it's so bad for for your body. It's, you know, you're you're sitting all the time for eight, nine, ten hours a day. You know, you're barely moving. Like, I don't know. Last year I had like a tennis elbow. <laughs> so stupid. Just just from, just from drawing. And it was like so. You know, uh, I'm still learning the process, I guess. And then to summarize it. Was simplification. 
education. And it's just so great to look at his work and see like what he was able to do with just a few lines of art and being like, I gotta, I gotta keep working towards that because that'll save, save a lot of sanity. Sequential art requires simplification. Okay, so we are essentially um, out of time, um, but I, I would like to invite, if, if somebody has a question, a brief question that we can answer in one minute, um, I invite you to stand up and ask a question, but it's these. Don't give any kind of rambling preambles. Jump into the question right away if you have one. You see, no, you can grab us in the hallway after this thing is done. Um, I'm sure we'd love to chat. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the